Welcome back to Flex Your Head, another special episode of Screen Therapy. On Flex Your Head, we take a breather from punk rock and mental health and explore classic punk albums, which I guess is good for mental health. Joining us on this episode once again is Donald. How's it going, Donald? Great, Jason. How are you doing? Oh, pretty good. We've got a wild one to talk about today. What album are we talking about on today's episode? We're talking about 1985's Frankenchrist by the Dead Kennedys. <laughs> Sorry, but you no longer need or want or even cared about here. Machines can do a better job than you, and this is what you get. For so, Frank and Christ was Dead Kennedy's third album, released in 1985, like you said, on Alternative Tentacles Records, which is Jello Biafra's label. Jello Biafra lead vocals in the band. We had East Bay Ray on guitar, Close Fluoride on bass and backing vocals, and D.H. Pellegro, R.I.P., on drums and backing vocals. Yeah, let's get right into it. What are your opening thoughts on the album? I was a huge fan of this album in high school. I was listening to it on repeat as like a 15, 16 year old. My most vivid memory of listening to this is being in my parents' basement in the computer room. And uh, my mom had uh, just left a job or been let go of a job and trying to... uh, you know, kind of form a bond with her. I'm like, Mom, you got to listen to Soup is Good Food. This is exactly <laughs> what they're doing to you. They're shitting you out their ass. And of course, she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. (laughs) That was where I was brought back to when I was listening to this, because, you know, I haven't listened to it in probably about uh, 15 years, maybe. I got really turned off the Dead Kennedys after watching Jello do a uh, spoken word performance at a travel (laughs) lodge. Well, I think we all got turned off to the Dead Kennedys at some point, if not for their weird reunion with a new vocalist and all that kind of stuff. What happened to me and my buddy is we would listen to thrash metal cassettes and hardcore cassettes in the tennis court while we're playing tennis. And one day we put this on and it was just such a weird album. And I'll never forget the feeling of hearing such a different style of music that I'd never really heard before. You know, obviously I'd heard punk and stuff, but this album was just, we got like five and six minute songs, mm-hmm. kind of spaghetti Western style stuff, surf stuff. There's actually an ad in Maximum Rock and Roll back in the day where it said, bringing the pain back to psychedelic music. <laughs> that was the ad that AT put into, the, into MRR. <laughs> Anybody that's heard it realizes, I think, that it's a concept album about being in the Reagan era, the Christian right, capitalism, commercialism, all the things that they talked about on the album. It's hard to pick this one over the rest of their albums for Flex Your Head. I mean, all their albums are quite good, especially Bedtime for Democracy and the first one. This is the one that I landed on, probably for some of the same reasons as you did. So... Let's talk about some of the songs on the album. Like I said before, it's 45 minutes, 10 songs. You're looking at four and a half minutes per song average. There's one straight ahead punk song, which D.H. Pellegro wrote called Hell Nation, which is the second song in the album. But the rest of it, how would you describe it? Like punk rock vaudeville or something? Or <laughs> Well, you uh, mentioned it off the top that they talked about it being psychedelic pain. This kind of concept album. Decibel did a seven page feature on yeah. Frank Christ about a year ago where Jello was saying, you know, he didn't have the talent to write a rock opera, so he settled for this concept album, and he was going for kind of an Alice Cooper horror style, but, you know, for real <laughs> horror, the real horrors of life. Yeah. But it's funny, because he's almost doing it in this, like, camp style, where you know, you're listening to these songs doing Sven Gulli or something. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. When I would, used to listen to it when I was younger, I always thought it sounded like a sci-fi album, like there's something science fiction about it, and I guess my My brain at the time didn't really register that it was, you know, because I heard this album probably back in 85, I would have been 12, 13. And to me, it always just felt like it was like a creepy science fiction late night TV show with, you know, these characters and almost like a radio play. 
And of course, you know, I identified with it because I was right there for MTV when that first started. And like the jocks, you know, the goons of Hazard, the cops and the jockorama. We are the goons of Hazard. Put a fight on your TV. We leave you in a pool of blood because we know terror. I was really into John Carpenter movies like They Live and Escape from New York. And I guess I always felt like this sort of sat in that same wheelhouse. I thought of the movie suburbia when listening to uh, this could be anywhere this Mm -hmm. could be everywhere there's such a different variation of songs they all feel like they have a tie whether thematically or sound wise living in the mid 80s and the kind of things that were going on with politics and jello obviously got beat up a lot when he was a kid (laughs) (laughs) and as an adult too probably by the police so i understand uh how we were lashing out on a lot of these songs Later on, like you said, I mean, people got turned off by the spoken word stuff because it was just so long-winded. And I think Mm -hmm. between him and Rollins, you know, if they both did a show, it'd be like six and a half hours. Any other songs that stand out? Talking about the guitar work, I think it stands out the most, maybe on uh, Goons of Hazard. I kind of enjoy the horns on MTV Get Off the Air (laughs) as well. That's a neat little interlude. (laughs) (laughs) At My Job is by far the worst song on the album. (laughs) It's interesting that it was the only one that they didn't play live in studio. I wonder if maybe that's why I uh, yeah. hate it so much. But it also just doesn't seem to have a, a whole lot to say. It's like they were like, okay, we need to do a song about how your job sucks. Yeah. Later on, he did Lard with Ministry. And that song, At My Job, almost sounds like a real precursor to the Lard stuff. Like just in a really rudimentary, like bad sounding way. Because a lot of the songs on the Lard albums are that really repetitive. But of course, you've got, you know, Ministry's industrial riffs in there too. So it kind of works. But this feels like when you're mopping at work. Vroom, 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 vroom. I'm <laughs> yeah. so bored. I'm mopping at work. My shift's <laughs> almost over. If that's <laughs> what they were trying to capture, the capture of actually being bored at work. Like, <laughs> like this is them in the studio at work being bored. Like, okay, great. You did it. <laughs> People talk about Stars and Stripes of Corruption, which is the last song on the album, which is actually over six minutes long as being their like magnum opus. But I, I don't know about that. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's a good way to end the album, I guess. But to me, the real like standouts on this album are Soup is Good Food, the opening track, Jockarama, Goons of Hazard, MTV Get Off the Air. That song six, seven, and eight are the real great pocket in this album. It's an amazing album yeah. all, all told, but uh, that's where it really, really gets wild. Bedtime for Democracy, it only came out a year later and had 21 songs in about the same running time. So they really, I don't know if they got like a really bad reaction to Frank and Christ and they had to just up the ante or whether it was purposefully a, a really different sideways turn for them. Seemed like a bit of a dumping ground after they broke up. It was just like, here's what's left. True. The spaghetti western idea, I see it, you know, Sergio Leone, that sort of style. Punk News said that it could be like a Tarantino soundtrack, which I kind of got that too, some some weirdo surf rock on there. The lyrics on the album, we, we could pick any little clip and put it into this episode and it would be amazing. I might even just do that. Put one here. one here my favorite lyric on the album by far is could it be they put out too many lousy records <laughs> <laughs> that's the moment that I, gets me every time i think the best line on that one is uh, there's something i don't like about a band who always smiles <laughs> yeah that's good too makes me think of the mccluskey uh episode we did where we were talking about uh the mccluskey song where he's railing against all the uh guys with good hair and nme yeah. <laughs> uh, jello biafra told spin magazine 1986 that one of the main focal points of frank and christ is if we are going to rise above the need for cops and laws, we can quit using the old American work ethic of seeing how much we can get away with and how much we can scam and who cares whose back you stab. 
for what you do to get it, as long as you get it. Also, he talks about on MTV Get Off the Air about how the DJ says, don't create, be sedate. That's what they're pushing. Don't think, consume. Don't go outside and see what our country is like. Sit inside and watch television. They finally figured out a way to get people to watch television commercials 24 hours a day. MTV first started, actually, I, was, I watched the very first broadcast of it, which was wild and weird. But I do remember thinking, okay, so my music is now all on TV with all these flashy, multicolored videos. And it was such a new thing to see, you know, Cyndi Lauper and Huey Lewis in the News and all these like bands that I'd heard on album, Tina Turner. And all of a sudden they were in these flashy videos. And it didn't really make a lot of sense to me at the time. And I see that now that it was such a huge beginning of, of marketing and music and how music was being projected to the masses. And that song always got me because. It was right around the same time that I started watching it. It was like, oh, wait a second. No, Jello is saying it's not good. It's not a good thing. Like, maybe it's not such a good thing. Maybe I shouldn't be sitting there and watching it all the time with my grandma or whatever. <laughs> I was looking back at um, some zines that uh, were, you know, reviewing DK's shows at the time and, and the album. And it seems like this was the track that resonated with people the most at the time was MTV Get Off the Air. Yeah. Specifically, that line you mentioned to, you know, don't create be sedate. Although, you know, I think he explores that same theme a little bit better. And this could be anywhere when he says, you know, so many people I know come of age tense and bitter eyed, can't create, so they just destroy. The band is amazing. The band musically is is so so good. I and mean, all three of them, the guitar player East Bay Ray is so inventive. The drummer is just so good. At, you know, he's right in the pocket. And the bass player's got this amazing style as well. They're all goofballs. They're like really cool, like endearing weirdo people. Angelo is easy to kind of make fun of and stuff. But the thing about this album, Frank and Christ, is that. There's nothing else like it, first of all. You know, it is more like a radio play or is more like a storytelling. You know, I don't know that a lot of bands really embrace that wholeheartedly like they did. You know, you had Bad Religion and you had TSOL and you had, you know, Agent Orange and all these bands that are part of that California punk scene, but no one really went for it. And this album was, I think, when they really went for it. And they would either get killed or, or people would love it. And uh, it's a very divisive record. Yeah, I, I agree in the sense that he's definitely not like spitting vitriol into the mic. There's, you know, there's some anger there, obviously, behind the lyrics. The way it comes out is much more performative. Yeah. The live footage from this era is really... <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's strange because, you know, they're playing these classics tighter than ever and, and people are just going wild. And then they land on a Frank and Grace song and People are kind of into it, but there's some pretty confused faces on some of the slower songs. He goes into these rants about, like, on Stars and Straits of Corruption. He says, your rich parents make sure that the South American people are under the bloody thumb again. USA for South Africa. Good night. Just stuff like that, right? <laughs> some of their stuff, earlier stuff, I never really got into. Like, I know the first one was really great, but they always had bad production. And I don't know, this one Jello produced with some help as well, but he was the producer. And the sound is just so great on this album. This came out right when a lot of the thrash metal stuff came out that I was real super into, and a lot of the punk stuff. And it had almost like that, you know, there are six minute songs, the production's really good. It almost felt like in the same wheelhouse as like a DRI album for me or something, even though the, they're so different. The production is just so much better than their fast punk stuff. So you could argue that, you know, the fast stuff is the best the Kennedy stuff, but this is the best album, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the one that's stuck with me the longest. There are some songs on those other albums that uh, are maybe better than some of the material here, like uh, I think Emotions is a really good song and California Uber Alice, which, um, yeah. I, I, you know, funnily enough, Jello didn't write the original two, and it is the one that uh, they spent the longest time in the studio on. It's, it's really good as well. Yeah, and Holiday in Cambodia, of course. They, they definitely have some other great songs in their catalog, and I don't even think that there's like, many amazing songs on Frankenchrist. It's just something about the whole package and the feel of it. And I don't know, like the aura, I hate to use the word aura. <laughs> it's got to be a better, <laughs> less new agey word than aura, but the feel of it really stuck with me and has. And I've been listening to it a lot over the last few weeks here. And God, it's just as good as ever. And you don't get sick of it. I mean, you want to skip past that my job, of course, but 
you don't get bored of it very easily. The the psych garage feel definitely fits in with that time period well mm-hmm. when that, you know, was becoming kind of a big kind of underground part of these scenes. So I guess we have to tackle or not tackle, I guess we have to at least mention the lawsuit thing. It's what everybody talks about when this album is mentioned really quickly. They um, wanted to put a front cover drawing by H.R. Geiger, who's most famous for doing Alien and other science fiction stuff. He has some really really wild paintings that were banned by the powers that be that ban things. So they wanted to use this one called Penis Landscape on the cover of the album, or potentially as an inside of a gatefold, and the band was not into it except for Jello, who was pushing it hard. And eventually they just decided to put it as a poster inside the album, so they put a sticker on the outside of the album that basically said, you know, warning. The exact wording was, some people may find the poster shocking, repulsive, or offensive. Life can sometimes be this way. (laughs) That was on the sticker. (laughs) So, of course, someone got a hold of it, ended up being a 14-year-old girl who bought it as a birthday present for her 11-year-old brother, which seems (laughs) ill-founded, but you never know. (laughs) The mother lodged a complaint, and next thing you know, Biafra is getting stormed at his apartment by cops, and the record label offices of Alternative Tentacles. They seize all the albums and demand to know where Geiger lives. Long story short, the label manager and Biafra both got arrested and charged with distributing harmful material to minors, and uh, they had the possibility of going to jail for that. The case was basically overturned. There was no conviction. The label almost uh, went bankrupt because of the whole thing, but they continued. And Jello said they needed a pigeon. They needed someone to actually charge with a crime. We were the first people to be prosecuted over an album in American history. From there, he became a huge champion of free speech with music and also was one of the most active opponents of the Parents Music Resource Center, the dreaded PMRC. Comments? <laughs> That's a lot, but it is what yeah. people talk about when this album is, is uh, mentioned. It's definitely overshadowed, you know, basically everything else uh, about this album is, you know, that they put this uh, explicit poster in there. Which, you know, Biafra claimed was supposed to be a representation of uh, the crass nature of consumerism and how everybody's screwing everybody else and et cetera, et cetera. I would love to know how much money they raised for their legal defense fund and, and how many posters they sold after they actually pulled it from the album and just put the insert in saying, you know, send away for the Geiger poster. I read somewhere that they were able to raise enough money to basically reprint the albums that were seized so that would be quite a bit of money they became this poster band for for oh my god like you're you're corrupting your children look at this you know they're called the dead kennedys like this is the very first thing that's bad about them and look at all these artworks that they have and here's this explicit poster that they're trying to just read to kids and it just became this huge thing and then if you're able to find the oprah winfrey appearance that jello made when he went up against tipper gore it was pretty gold after the trial in a paper called the, the Metro in Nashville, Tennessee, Tipper Gore was asked about my trial and said, quote, I'd like to take credit for it. I accuse you of trying to destroy my career and ruin my right to make a living. And, and for being operating as a front for people like Jesse Helms, Phyllis Schlafly, in order to drive the arch-conservative wedge into the mainstream. Rabbi Cooper, if you think public enemies got problems against Jews, wait till you meet the organization endorsed in Tipper Gore's book, like the Back and Control Center. The Back and Control Center is a group of cops from, I believe, Orange County, who send manuals to police departments and the parents claiming that, among other things, the Jewish star is a symbol for Satan, that high-top tennis shoes and black clothing can be a sign that your child might be turning to heavy metal and should therefore be deprogrammed. If a kid shoplifts or becomes involved in a gang, then, well, it must be the music's fault. To me, practicing fraud like that to the point where doctors who used your video in a Milwaukee hospital told a kid who was treated was came in to be treated for clinical depression that his iron maiden t-shirt was the problem that to me is the real child abuse. Mm-hmm. Tipper, no. Tipper, let you... they also <laughs> this is funny because it's so innocuous compared to the other one but they got sued by the shriners because the cover of the album has these shriners driving around these miniature cars and there's some sort of a parade the four shriners that were depicted in the pictures sued the Diannies in 1986 <laughs> it's almost like they jumped on 
you know, oh, they're getting sued for something else or they're getting charged for something else. I mean, there's nothing derogative about the picture. It, it's weird because there's not even the name of the band or anything on the front. It's just these four Shriners and these red hats driving down the road and probably one of the worst album covers. <laughs> but, but a very memorable one. So you want to do some YouTube comments? Sure. All right. So, yeah, I'm just going to go for it because this, this is a weird package. It's a real cornucopia of, of weirdos here. Horp Snark, three months ago, and it's been edited. We should put that out there. I've known every word of this record for more than three quarters of my life. I'm 46. This is my favorite DK album because it tells a story about how fucked up our government is and how fucking dumb humans are. I love you guys. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> how dumb humans are. I love you guys. <laughs> this one was written seven years ago by Riddleus1988. October 26, 1985. I was fortunate enough to see the DKs play an SLC on this tour. Fucking rad. I had two copies of the LP. My friend and I came up with the idea of hanging up the penis landscape poster in the display case at our high school. It was worth the laughs to see people's reaction when they realized what they were looking at. Hilarious! It was only up for a few minutes before a teacher took it down and destroyed it. I had no idea that the poster would be soon banned or worth so much money. I wouldn't have sold it anyway. Hard to believe that was 31 years ago. Still a hardcore punk kid. Thanks. <laughs> Love you guys. Foxy Lady 9232 posted six years ago. Frank and Christ is like listening to a fall album. Part of you is thinking, I'm uncomfortable. But another part of you is thinking, this is class. I was only 12 when I first heard this, and I still haven't overcome that uncomfortable class feeling. Thank Biafra. It's important that whoever reads this comment is kind, at least to one person in the next day. Kindness is good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I went into the kindness thing. <laughs> Any final thoughts on the album? It's kind of unfortunate the whole poster thing overshadows everything else about the album because there are some songs on there that are worth listening to and thinking about although there are parts of it there that are very forgettable as well i left my most recent listenings not so much wanting to like listen to frank christ over and over again but thinking of other songs that i liked better and wanted to go to like the Avengers, uh, the American and Me, or uh, Screaming Sneakers, Violent Days, and uh, X Ray Specs, I Live Off You, um, yeah. all kind of in a, a similar theme as some of the Frank and Christ stuff, but I think doing it better. So, yeah, I don't know if this one will end up in regular rotation again, but it uh, at least has reminded me of some uh, old favorites and uh, it reminded me a little bit about why I liked it at the time, too, when I was you know, 16 in the basement. Yeah, I think it's a quintessential punk album from that area, Bay Area during that time. Obviously, like a lot of bands from LA and San Francisco were around that punk scene as well, but this one is just the one that really, I don't know if it was because it was widely distributed and that people talked about it because of the whole controversy, but you know, I didn't really hear about any of those bands until I listened to this. And I don't want to say it's a gateway, but it was definitely the one that kind of put me into that more melodic style. Like, I would never have heard Bad Religion if it wasn't for Dead Kennedys. I wouldn't have heard Circle Jerks. I wouldn't have heard Avengers. I wouldn't have heard any of these bands. And Jello did an album with No Means No, which is this amazing, I think we all know who they are, but if you don't, it's this amazing British Columbia hardcore punk band from way back in the late 70s. And I don't think I ever would have been turned on to No Means No if it wasn't for Dead Kennedys. I think if I hadn't heard the Dead Kennedys, in particular this album, Frank and Christ, and the way that it has this really dark, weirdo vibe, this strange satirical sense of humor, very sarcastic, political, but not heavy-handedly political, but just more like fun political, if that makes any sense. And No Means No has that same dark humor in their music. And so, yeah, I really don't think I would have been into No Means No as much if I hadn't heard Dick Kennedy's first. I probably would have just been like, eh, no, this is weird, not for me. I'm really glad that I found this. Really glad that I won some tennis matches while listening to it. <laughs> If you want to listen to more episodes of this podcast, you can go to ScreamTherapyHQ.com. Uh, there's probably about uh, maybe 15 or so Flex Your Head episodes tackling classic punk albums. And there's also the main podcast, which is about punk rock and mental health. And that's been going now for almost four years. So there's all kinds of episodes there you can listen to. If you want to go check out more information about what I'm up to with my book and the podcast, again, it's ScreamTherapyHQ.com. 
Well, thanks a lot for talking to me about Dead Kennedy's Frankenchrist today, Donald. Thanks for having me on again. Shut your head!